Uh, thank you so much uh, for inviting me and uh, for this opportunity uh, to present my perspective on these things. Uh, I'm a theoretician uh, by training, and so uh, I'll be talking about entirely uh, theoretical result. And I apologize in advance that, that the lack of uh, particular application in my presentation. So I'll be presenting a prelim preliminary analysis of three uh, different problems that I picked up along the way by reading the optic literature. Uh, first, first, the first project, project is 3D tomographic face retrieval. And I'm going to talk about uh, the uniqueness result about in this area, particularly with a, a perspective of converting tomographic face retrieval problem into something like projection tomography, as in the case of a Quayo EM, uh, with the goal of perhaps utilizing the existing technique in Quayo EM to do um, orientation alignment, particle classification, and so on, to deal with, in general, measurement uncertainty. Uh, secondly, uh, following from a particular uh, model in um, tomographic face retrieval, there will come the tomographic face unwrapping problem. And I'm going to talk about a unique theorem about that in this area. Finally, I'd like to talk about one bit face retrieval using very little information to do face retrieval. Uh, perhaps, again, uh, with the uh, intent of using uh, these very little information to do perhaps uh, initialization method in, in um, a phase retrieval or, or phase unwrapping. All right, so first, uh, phase retrieval to projection. How do I convert phase retrieval problem to a projection uh, tomography? So first of all, I'd like to uh, introduce two uh, coded, aperture, uh, coded aperture and uncoded aperture. So this is a uh, schematics uh, of that. Uh, t particularly with the uncoded aperture, I'm going to put a random mask behind uh, the object or the right behind the uh, exit waves and the me measurement. Okay, uh, why introduce coded, coded aperture? Uh, adding, uh, this is for adding um, diversity measurement da uh, data and also coded aperture will allow you to break the translation and uh, reflection symmetry in a typical phase retrieval data. All right, so f first forward model, I'd like to introduce what is called in mathematics a right of approximation. I think in uh, electron microscopy, it's called a high energy uh, approximation. In, in uh, optics, perhaps it's called a quasi phase object approximation. So you start with the Helmholtz equation. Uh, with a refractive index n square n. Uh, this is 3D, and you have a wave number kappa. Uh, for the time being, I'm going to set, set a wave number to be 1. And then uh, you write the solution as a, a quasi phase object uh, with the initial uh, the incident wave ui, which is a plane wave, propagating the z direction, and then you have e to the i psi, psi being more or less a projection of this unknown object f. In a, along the direction of the optical axis. Okay, and so the object, I'm, which I'm going to call object, is n squared minus 1. This is a medium heterogeneity, which you like to recover. All right. Okay, so um, now I like to do uh, information counting. So for me, very important to do precise information counting, I like to go to discrete setting. OK, so I, I started out with a continuum. Now I'm going to de define a, a class of, um, you can think of it, a discrete model that parallel the continuum uh, model. That has a, a property of preserving certain structure. OK, so think about this in from a numerical point of view, it's like uh, uh, structure preserving discretization. OK, so first of all, I have, I have a, a n cube uh, object, n by n by n, and I'm going to call that uh, uh, class of object O n. So it's a, have n cube uh, dimension with a complex uh, value. And I like to, for example, define a z line. What is, what is a discrete z line? What well, discrete z line is going to be written like this? 
and it is parameterized by by you know in in the z direction, for example, uh, and then x and y coordinate parameterized by this very simple linear relation, and except that z only take on the discrete value, so z n the script z n really just uh, you know from zero to n minus one, for example. So the n integers, and then uh, the offset. Uh, to, to uh, this define projection, you really need to cover all the possible lines that can inter intersect with the object. So you actually have to use the offset C1, C2 in a bigger integer uh, set, 2n minus 1, in order to cover all the lines. So altogether, you can see that we, we will have uh, 2n minus 1 square lines in each direction. So alpha and beta specify the direction of the line in three, three dimension, and C1, C2 uh, just tell, give you the discrete set of lines going in the same direction, and they are exactly 2n minus 1 square of them. Okay, I, I want to uh, re restrict myself uh, to, to, to alpha and beta less than one modulus, so that you, know, you don't have a one line that get two parameterization. So if I have Z line, then all the slope must be in the x and y direction must be less than or equal to one. And if I talk about x line, then the slope in the y and z direction must be less than or equal to one. So that don't they don't overlap. The only one that overlap is that the slope exactly one. Then they could be you know either z line or x line or y line. But but those are very special lines. Okay. Now because of that. Uh, I need to, to avoid wrap around if I want to do discrete uh, average along a particular line. I, I want to do zero padding uh, of f so that I, I, I locate my f in uh, zp uh, to the third power instead of zn to the third power, right? So that uh, I zero pad around uh, zn, and so that when I do the line uh, average, I don't wrap around it and create art artifact. Okay, now another problem with the discretization, uh, discrete, discrete uh, tomography is that when you do every, when you, when you specify a line, the line uh, could be, have very irrational slope, for example, it may not inter intersect with your grid point. Right? So how do, you, how do you do averaging along a discrete line, so to speak, right, with the discrete um, uh, coordinate in, in Z? Well, one thing is to do is to do c continuous interpolation. Right, so I'm going to use a, a Dirichlet a, a kernel to interpolate. For example, if I were to uh, here, I'd say f sub z is an interpolation in x y direction. Okay, so think about my good points. I, I start with the grid, and then if I look at the z direction, and then all the the the, the plane, the the grid plane correspond to the z equal constant, z equal zero, one, two, three, four, five. And that plan should be interpolated continuously. So I use a Dirichlet kernel to interpolate in the x, y direction if I'm talking about z line. If I talk about x line, of course, I would be interpolating in y, z direction and so on. Okay. And so, all right, so what, what, what is the benefit of doing this? The benefit of doing this is that, so, okay, now here's a, discrete line projection along the z, z line direction, z alpha beta, alpha beta again specifying the slope in x and y direction. And, and so it's just, it's just discrete sum, okay? Now this is a well defined because I already interpolate uh, along the x, y direction, so, so therefore the first and second coordinate do not have to land in the um, integer, right? They could be ar arbitrary numbers. And then again, I, I, the offset c1, c2, can range in z, 2n minus 1, z 2n minus 1, so there are 2n minus 1 square of them. And the important thing here, here is that th this is the discrete Fourier theorem, right? If you take this, you take the Fourier transform, uh, discrete Fourier transform of this guy, the projection, discrete projection, is actually, is give, is actually equal to, as you would expect, okay? You take the uh, 3D discrete Fourier transform of this 3D discrete object, F, and you, 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 you specialize on that particular Fourier slice, okay, as, as it should, right? So th this is the important for us because the, if the discrete setting does not reflect the continuous setting, especially if it violates that, 
then the result that, that we're going to uh, prove will not be uh, carry a lot of physical meaning. All right, so uh, I'm going to use uh, a script T to de denote all the prop direction that I'm going to uh, measure uh, with coded aperture or uncoded aperture. Okay, so T, you know, in this case of Z line, for example, with alpha beta one, alpha beta with less than or equal to one. Uh, as, I, as I said, I, we prefer to stay with this kind of limitation, even though when you actually do numerical computation, you probably want to uh, remove it and have some way to remove it to uh, make your coding as well easier. Uh, for, for the theoretical, uh, the mathematical uh, theory that I'm going to present, this actually come in uh, more uh, convenience. All right, so for t equal that, I'm going to write fz alpha beta as f sub t. All right, so, the, so let's say we start with a bone approximation, which is usually easier. So bone approximation, you approximate this by ui times one plus i psi, okay? So, so there you, so here, here's the first uh, unique theorem. Suppose you know, uh, so he, here I define what is called diversified, diversity condition for the measurement scheme. Uh, I don't want to go into that, that scheme, but, but, but that condition, but because most of the practical uh, tilt method all satisfy that. And this is just prevent some pathological um, measurement scheme that, that you know, people who are untrained my stumble onto because obviously we're trying to prove a theorem, so therefore some some of the pathological thing has to be included by a mathematical condition. But as I said, any tilt uh, method like one axis tilt, uh, dual axis tilt, uh, conical uh, tilt, they all f satisfy the diversity condition. All right. So now you, I'm, I'm focused on the z line again, and so there are n z line projection. And, and but by itself is not enough, right? Think about if you start with the slope from negative one to one, you open up 90 degrees, so, so to speak, okay? And th this, at least according to the theorem, you, you will have to add another one that, that go to break certain, uh, you know, basically blind spots, so to speak, okay? So alpha, beta, zero, with zero in the th third dimension, so this is, must be looking at the x, y plane direction, so on the side view. So besides the z, uh, z direction, but you also have to look at the side view, but you only need one, and so therefore that make the counting of the diffraction pattern n plus one. So if you have n plus one coded, so here I'm, we're using coded diffraction pattern with known orientation, so this is very important. Now, the, this is not the main goal of this presentation, but this is just assuming you know the uh, non-orientation, then you, you have a unique 3D structure up to a phase factor, of course. And then, of course, there are a lot of um, numerical algorithms can develop going through uh, reconstructing the 3D object all, all at once. Now, uh, now here, uh, s suppose you don't have uh, uh, orientation known to us. So you can't do this, right? Even if you have many diffraction patterns. So normally uh, you, one will start classifying the diffraction pattern according to, a, uh, according to a direction, orientation, and then do averaging if it's very noisy. And then, and then you start align those diffraction pattern to deduce uh, the orientation, relative orientation first before you do 3D phase retrieval. Okay, so here uh, we're presenting a slightly different point of view. Say, hey, suppose I can convert each diffraction pattern to the diffraction pattern to projection data, and, and then use projection data, many of them, in all different directions, to do uh, orientation alignment. That is alternative route, and this is on the route that I'm, a particular perspective that I'm presenting. So, so this requires converting diffraction pattern into projection, okay? So, so here, here's a, make use of what, what I call the sector condition. So normally in X-ray, for example, uh, the refractive uh, in index can be written as one minus delta minus I, I beta. So normally it, this, this quantity is very small. So you can think of uh, in each diffraction uh, direction average the, the, the angle uh, in the complex plane is really limited. Uh, in other words, it doesn't occupy the entire uh, two pi range. 
But in particular, if beta greater than zero, for example, as in the case of absorp absorption, uh, you actually are limited to the low half plane, right? So you can set A to be negative pi, B equals zero, and you will have your angle at, in each pixel to be limited to that half, lower half plane, okay? And, and in fact, if beta is very small, you can also th think of this not just a lower half plane, it's actually a very tiny wedge in the, in the negative axis, okay? So th this can be used as a prior information uh, to do reconstruction. So, so, so basically, so this is what I call the sector condition. And then with the one, uh, with the probability at least that much, uh, so it's very close, the, the power in this, uh, rate, in, the, in this ratio is a, is a non-zero element of this projection over two. Okay, so if B minus A is less than two pi, and, and if, if you have, don't have a sparse object, but rather a ra rather full object, and you will have this quant term very, very small, and you have very, very high probability to reconstruct uh, the, def the projection uh, data from the diffraction pattern. Okay, so that, that's the gist of this uh, uh, theorem. Uh, uh, the, the, the people can also use other kinds of prior information to, uh, to uh, convert one diffraction pattern into one projection data. Okay. Now, uh, let's just test, just use the simplest numerical algorithm, like Wartinger flow, where you minimize this uh, squared kind of data, or you use uh, you know, alternating projection or error reduction to minimize this kind of uh, loss function. Uh, you have, uh, this is the NSR, so not a per percentage of noise in the data, uh, but some noise. Uh, you can see the point of this curve is to show that even with a very simple algorithm, uh, your noise magnification uh, uh, factor, right, is almost like one, slightly greater than one. You put 40% noise, your reconstruction of the projection data is about maybe 45%, okay? A small uh, noise amplification, in other words, even with a very non-optimized, optimal algorithm. All right, so uh, what, what if you don't use a Born approximation, then you have to deal with uh, a different, uh, a, co a complex uh, value uh, object which uh, violates your sector condition. And so you don't theoretically convert one diffraction pattern into a, a, a projection data. But th there you need two projection, uh, I'm sorry, two projection, two diffraction patterns. So one uh, coded, like this, and one uncoding. How do you do that? Well, I assume that there's a beam splitter, like what uh, uh, Yakov uh, present in his uh, uh, poster, that if you have a beam splitter and you split the exit uh, wave into uh, two different beam, one measure with a, a no uh, mass, the other one measure with mass, and then you have uh, two different snapshots for the one view, the same view of the object. Okay, so what's good about that? So what, what is good about that is it can, it can allow you to convert just about any object, okay, any projection, regardless of the complex value, no uh, um, uh, object uh, uh, domain constraint, support constraint, nothing. And you can construct uh, the uh, projection data actually with a high accuracy with noise stability. All right, so this is what the, the, the uniqueness theorem says. Uh, we, we also allow, allow this object to have uh, uncertain uh, locations. So we are thinking about, you know, in the, in the case of X-ray serial crystallography, the identical particle going through the, the prop region, and they, at each uh, projection, the location of the object is not known. So we allow this uh, unknown uh, translation and so we write this star uh, to allow this unknown translation. And, and then again, so if these two things produce the same pair of coded and uncoded diffraction pattern, let's say using the beam splitter, then you can conclude that, well, th these two objects must be the same, okay? And almost surely, again, why almost surely? I'm referring back to 
I'm using random mask, and there's a probability distribution. And then what this is saying is that almost certainly, if you pick up a random mask, you're going to have this uniqueness result. All right, so another way to produce two patterns from one is, is use a, a, you know, additional tilt. Uh, we imagine, let's say, in the a, in a case of a sample holder, you have a lot of identical particle uh, uh, lying on the grid, uh, maybe randomly oriented. Uh, you can take one uh, snapshot of the whole, you know, maybe one by one or maybe all together, uh, by, and, and you have a collection of diffraction pattern from one tilt, and you, you tilt the whole uh, sample grid with uh, some, uh, you know, tilt, and you do another uh, um, measurement of diffraction pattern, now with a coded op aperture. So one with uncoded aperture, one with coded aperture, okay? Again, to provide diversified measurement, so with the pairwise measurement with the tilt, uh, one can also uh, have this uniqueness result. So uh, here we're thinking about there's a collections of uh, uncoded aperture, coded T0, and coded aperture, coded T. And, and suppose for each uh, coded aperture, there's a one uh, T0, again, a particular direction. Uh, they could be the same, uh, like in the case of beam splitter. In the case of uh, uh, you know, a, a dual act, uh, with a tilt, then of course there they will be different orientation. But for each T, there's T0 in there that can pair with T in the sense of their relative orientation is known. Okay? Then, and, and, and in addition, of course, uh, this uh, coded, aperture, coded aperture and uncoded aperture uh, both produce the same diffraction pattern for G and F. Then you can also assert that these two objects, even with the unknown translation, unknown orientation, I didn't, I did, we, did, we did not have to know T0, we did not have to know T, we only need to know certain pairwise condition between the orientation in T0 and orientation in T. Uh, then you can also assert that, uh, you know, that the equality of the projection data for all T in this uh, coded aperture uh, set. All right, so uh, here, again, running a very simple algorithm, uh, alternating projection. Again, here we have two diffraction pattern. Obviously, there are two uh, different ways of handling the two diffraction pattern. You can handle them in parallel. You can handle them in series. Uh, this, so you have two versions of alternating projection, serial alternating projection, parallel alternating projection. Again, you could always have a Wattinger flow. And now here, if you just do this, it wouldn't work. It, it doesn't work well at all. And you have to have, use a little bit of one-bit initialization method, which I'm going to de uh, delay, postpone until the, toward the end of the talk to talk about this one-bit initialization method. But nevertheless, again, over the point of this graph, it to sh show you that the noise amplification factor is almost like one. So the 30% noise there, no matter which method you use, okay, you get maybe 35% relative error in your reconstruction. All right, so phase unwrapping. So if you use a write-up uh, approximation, you naturally have to face the phase unwrapping problem uh, because uh, even when you know that, that these two are the same, after all, FT and GT and F and G are really what we are after, not the E to the I FT or E to the I GT. Okay? So that's a phase unwrapping problem uh, that we have to uh, analyze. So for, for uh, a phase unwrapping problem, uh, tomographic in the tomographic setting, there's some advantage of doing it in tomographic, tomographic setting. Okay, so um, again, let me just repeat the problem. The problem here is that you, you ha suppose you have GT equal FT in, in a set of uh, projection, right? Uh, modulus 2 pi, okay, for each pixel. When can you say F equal G? Okay, so that's a, a nutshell, the phase unwrapping problem. Okay, so if you look at the di difference of that GT minus FT, uh, the first thing I would like to put is a 
impose a condition so that HT is actually independent of projection. Okay, so how, how does that go about? Uh, how do we go about doing this? So first of all, observe that because I'm doing continuous continuous interpolation, right? So GT and FT, they they will be both continuous function in T. Okay, so in, in other words, when, when you change your projection slightly differently, you, you you expect your projection will be very similar. Okay, so that's a con continuity. Okay, on the other hand, though, the difference between GT and FT is an integer value. Okay. 2 pi, in fact, in fact, 2 pi multiple, integer multiple 2 pi. So therefore, these are, there's a certain inconsistency um, um, unless h of t is constant in t. Okay? So what you have to do is that, okay, if you have to arrange your measurement so that their neighbor, uh, adjacent measurement are very close in angle in projection, right? So, so that, that's what we, what we call the epsilon closely connected T, right? Okay. So once you have that uh, me measurement scheme, you can show that h of t is independent of t, and then do a little bit more work. You know, you you again. Uh, so this this is a addition to additional assumption you have to put. First of all, you have to have eto condition. Uh, your object uh, in two neighboring uh, pixel cannot jump too much in the object value. It has to be less than pi for two adjacent points, n and prime. And again, diversify, diversity condition. Okay, as I said before, most of the practical two methods satisfy this. Okay, so, so here, uh, again, you, you look at the n um, projection in the z direction, but that's not enough. You also have to look at and two other condition, two other direction that cannot be parameterized as z line. So this will be x line. This will be y line. So you need two additional uh, projection in order to assert now uh, that g will be equal f. Okay. Again, t is closely connected in the sense that I talked about, meaning that it has to be close enough so that the two multiple uh, uh, integer multiple two pi will be inconsistent with the fact that your projection is continuous with respect to the orientation. Okay, so, um, so I can skip that analysis. So, so uh, more concretely, so here I'm looking at the measurement scheme. This is direction uh, onto which in, into which you're doing the projection. If you look at this uh, gray circle, of pi, two pi, pi over two, and take another one, pi over two, and that will satisfy the condition of the theorem. You can take any two of these three uh, great arcs of range pi over two, you will satisfy that condition. Now, this is the, obviously an example of a dual axis toot. Now, uh, perhaps more conveniently, uh, one can also use a single conical tilt uh, of range uh, pi over pi instead of dual um, axis tilt, each with a range of pi over two, but then you have to use the conical angle uh, slightly greater than pi over four, but less than pi over two, okay? So pi over two is actually a bad, bad, bad way, that's a basically a single axis tilt. I think some of the speaker already comment on that. There's a blind spot uh, associated with such, uh, a single axis tilt, but as long as your angle is between pi over four and pi over two, Especially when you're closer to pi over four than closer to pi over two, well, I believe that the, the result will be better. Okay, so one bit phase uh, uh, retrieval. So so let, let me think. Uh, introduce a one bit phase retrieval. Okay, so uh, in a nutshell, here's the problem. Suppose you have an unknown object x star. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna, instead of, uh, at, the, at the time, that's f formulated as a vector problem. So, uh, so here I'm thinking about just a, a dimension of n instead of n cube. Uh, I'm, I'm given a one bit um, per pixel data. So this is the data I'm given, okay? You look at absolute value of A, A is a measurement matrix. Uh, in the case of coded aperture uh, measurement, you'll be a Fourier transform. 
uh, multiply with the, uh, the mask transmission function, which is the diagonal matrix, and you subtract the threshold, and you look at the sign of that. Okay, so it could be positive uh, one or negative one. So B is either positive one or negative one. It's a one bit information. Okay, now the question actually is not how do you, it, it, you can do, do this, is if it's possible to choose uh, tau, the threshold, so that the problem has a solution, has a unique solution. Okay, so is there a threshold tau which make the above problem a feasible problem? <clears throat> All right, so, so, so here, here's our, uh, way, uh, the way we think about this problem. Uh, you, you look at, so given x star, you look at the measurement data, a x star, uh, look at the absolute value. You separate, uh, you separate your um, uh, measurement uh, matrix into two parts, okay? Those rows that correspond to the weak signal, meaning wh whose absolute value is less than tau. Okay, and those are strong si system that whose uh, whose uh, measurement um, data is greater than tau. Okay, so you, you, you break in your, your your measurement matrix A into the subsystem, weak subsystem, and strong subsystem. Okay, so here I'm I'm just writing writing as you know uh, informally as such. Okay, and there are these are the row matrix uh, of sub sub matrix of, of A. Okay. So I, more, more also, ideally, we would like to choose tau to be independent of x star, okay? Uh, so that if you choose, uh, you're given a, you choose x star, uh, um, choose your tau, and you can start doing your one-bit phase retrieval. Uh, with, so one-bit phase retrieval, we think about some detector that are very, very crude, that only can give you either one or negative one of, uh, measurement. A value. All right. So the the way we think about this problem is uh, okay. Look look at this. Uh, you take the uh, weak system subsystem. Uh, you compute the, the least singular vector. Okay. Compute the least singular vector. Uh, now suppose A is like isometry, as in case of Fourier transform, for example. Right. And then you can, you can write x, x hat, that's our, our estimator, as a leading singular vector of the strong system. Okay? And this is by isometry of A. And so in, in the case of A is not isometry, for example, then you can do QR decomposition, and then the, uh, the, the setup will be a slightly more complicated because your constraint will not be just unit uh, vector, but rather Rx. Uh, acting on x, uh, Rx uh, has a unit norm. So this will be more complicated. Now, in the case of uh, IID independent in, uh, identical distributed Gaussian matrix A, then R is almost like identity if n is large. Okay? And in that case, you could uh, approximate x hat by these, again, um, leading singular vector of this strong system. Okay, I, I put a star here, that's a typo here. There's no star here. Okay, so, so here is a, a theorem that we proved a couple of years ago. Uh, suppose A is a Gaussian, uh, again, circularly symmetric co complex um, Gaussian matrix. And if you choose your um, weak system, so that it has a number of rows greater than n, n is dimension of the object, and, but also the, the square of that number of rows is greater than the total number of measurement, capital N, okay? And then you can, you can assert, make this assertion that, that this error matrix is diminishing, okay, uh, the, uh, because the, you know the to the the uh, dimension of the, the or, or the rank of the subsystem is less than capital N. So this will be a dimension factor is capital N goes to infinity with a probability very 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 close to one. Okay. In particular, in particular, again, if the ratio of measurement to the num uh, dimension of the object is much greater than one, if you choose um, the sub weak subsystem. 
uh, in relation to the object dimension and the number of measurement um, in this fashion, then you can show that it uh, converges in a power power um, a power of 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 a capital N. Uh, the the best you can do is a one half of power of capital N. Okay, if you were to choose that that um, that uh, the number of subsystem weak subsystem is a the harmonic average or geometric average of little n and capital N, square root of n. Square root of little n times capital N, that corresponds to alpha equal 0.5, and then you will have uh, these guys that decays like 1 over square root n. All right, so again, um, that's just theory and a very crude theory. Uh, th does it work in reality? Okay, so here is a Fourier phase retrieval. Uh, so look at uh, 256, 256 uh, phantom. Uh, we also make it more uh, difficult by randomly flip the face of the phantom, so no longer a real um, object, but rather it's a complex object with the um, angle range of over two, 2 pi, so randomly assign uh, a face to each pixel. And so here I'm, I'm doing exactly what I, I said in the previous slide. I'm taking the square root, I'm, I'm keeping uh, this amount of subsystem as a weak system, uh, square root of n times uh, number of measurement, capital N. Uh, how, what is capital N? Well, here, I'm, again, I'm using two diffraction pattern, okay, for this uh, uh, complex object. Uh, and then I just, uh, then I look at the, 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 uh, the complement, the strong system, and look at the leading eigen uh, uh, vector because it's the isometric, isom isometric measurement scheme. I look at the leading eigen uh, vector of the strong system, and I just plot it. Okay, so what, what am I plotting here? This is the correlation between the true object and my reconstruction. Okay, and the right the right panel here is the phase difference. So you can see that phase difference are almost almost perfectly recovered. Very, 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 very high fidelity in, in phase. Uh, the, the magnitude, however, is slightly degraded, but this is a zero noise, 10% noise, 20% noise. So what, what's the lesson here is that because you're using so little information in doing reconstruction, it's actually very stable with respect to, to noise. You, you, the noise in your data will affect your reconstruction very little. And, and so that, that would be, in, in our view, a very good way of doing initialization it obviously, it doesn't give you a perfect reconstruction with a two uh, diffraction pattern, but it, perhaps it can give you a very good way of doing initialization. And so here we apply this to 3D uh, tomographic uh, uh, phase retrieval. Uh, I take the, again, a phantom. I, I chop uh, 512 and 500 by 512, real value phantom, and I, I just cut it off in a 65 pieces uh, 64 pieces and stack them up into a 3D object. Okay. Now here I like to test it. If I if I don't use coded aperture, I just do uh, normal uh, phase retrieval uh, projection uh, measuring the uh, diffraction pattern uh, in let's see how many different way we are measuring. So we we here we apply uh, conical angle uh, uh, looking at the conical angle of pi over four. The measurement scheme is parameterized by by this. I'm looking at 153 snapshot, okay, using a conical tilt, and uh, I use the threshold, which is the average value of the diffraction intensity. So, lots of diffraction penalty. Look at each pixel, different pixel. Um, you look at the average value of that. Use that as a threshold to separate strong signal versus weak signal. Okay. Now, uh, so here's a here's a, a unique the theorem. Suppose, suppose you you don't you only know uh, you don't know the face, okay? You only know one face face mask. You only know one bit information of the face mask. So this is a, trying to do reconstruction uh, without. I think I. Yeah, I I, I this is uh, two slides a foot. Sorry. So that, that one, 3D, uh, this, is, uh, this is reconstruction, okay? So this is a phantom. This is, a, again, no coded aperture. 
just uncall the aperture 153 diffraction pattern. You use that method to do uh, now, uh, you know, one bit phase retrieval, tomography phase retrieval, and this is the this is the outcome of that. It's actually we if we compute the correlation between the reconstruction and the true object, it's actually 0.9 percent, 0.9 something, very high co correlation. However, the result does depends on the object. If you start flipping. You're changing the phantom into a complex value phantom. The, the result de de degrade, they, uh, is de degraded a little bit. If you use coding aperture, the method will be slightly improved uh, on that, but not much. Okay? But nonetheless, we think about this not so much about uh, a bare reconstruction method, but rather as an initialization method, which is needed when, when you do um, very noisy uh, reconstruction uh, in, in tomography. Okay, so uh, blind tomography can also be done with the one bit information, and and this is the this is the uh, another theorem in that direction is that uh, you you don't need to have a mask, uh, no uh, you don't have the full knowledge of your uh, uh, prop or your pupil function, you only need to have a one bit information. Uh, uh, about your pupil function, and you can, uh, and if your measurement scheme satisfies certain uh, mixing uh, property, which I'm not go going to into the detail, then you can reconstruction both your object, uh, uh, so difference between the your reconstruction, your true object will be just a linear phase, which is inevitable in, in blind tachography. Um, All right, so the, the mixing scheme that I was telling you about in the, the theorem is, uh, can be very simply illustrated by the two scheme. You take the, the regular uh, raster scan, you just randomly perturb, perturb it in you know, two different directions. This is perturbation in one, both direction, but the synchronized perturbation, you can also do independent perturbation. Either one, they're, they're, they both satisfy uh, the mixing property, and that will allow you to do blind tachography. So this is this is the again numerical experiment. Uh, you're given uh, a one bit information to do blind uh, tachography. There's no noise given in the data. Uh, there's a 50 percent overlap. If you increase the overlap in your tachography to 65, 66 percent to 75 percent, you can see the convergence uh, is much happen much faster. And this is a convergent. This is iter a very simple iteration uh, of the, about a couple hundred steps, and uh, and 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 the method we use is the ADMM that associate with this augmented Lagrangian. Oops. Okay, conclusion. So uh, here's my uh, perspective. Uh, I'd like to be able to handle measurement uncertainty such as unknown orientation, location, etc. Uh, the the particular scenario we, we propose is uh, converting uh, diffraction uh, data per projection, per direction, per orientation to the projection data. And then use in existing technique perhaps to handle these measurement uncertainty. Um, and then uh, in the case of uh, tomographic phase unwrapping, uh, we uh, our hope is that eventually we can elu uh, eliminate uh, these uh, discontinuity condition that that uh, I'm sorry uh, to account for discontinuity that violate the ETO condition. Uh, finally, the one bit phase retrieval as a as a initialization method uh, to that our thinking the way of think about this is to extract a global feature from a very rough data in order to escape uh, the local minimum uh, if you were to apply a standard technique okay thank you very, very much.